I will ask counsel to please state on the record that you have no objection to me administering a binding oath to this witness remotely. No objection. No objection. Thank you. Doctor, if you will, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're going to give in this call to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I, I swear, yes, I do. Thank you. Right. Good morning, doctor. My name is Matt Kahn. I represent the Thomas family in this case. Um, will, will you please state your full name? Josefina Victoria Tramfa Abud. Okay. Um, and doc, Dr. Tramfa Abud, um, what is what is the role of an economist in a civil case such as this? Uh, the role of an economist uh, in a case such as this is to evaluate all the data available uh, that is specific to the case, to conduct the uh, applicable research, to evaluate uh, the potential uh, economic damages by applying the methodologies that are relevant for the particular analysis, to apply the data that is relevant to the particular analysis, um, sometimes to provide commentary on the analysis provided by opposing experts, meaning opposing experts conducting analysis of economic damages, um, and sometimes to provide testimony at deposition or trial. Okay, uh, and what, what are, the, um... What are the methodologies that you apply as an excuse me as an economist in um, in a case like this? In a case like this, the methodology involves various aspects. Uh, in my opinion, the methodology always starts with identifying what are the relevant facts that affect um, the measurement of damages. Um, evaluate fully the applicability of documents and other research sources. And then the methodology includes evaluations of uh, the use of data for the determination of uh, work-life expectancy, for example, um, conduct calculations regarding a period of loss, evaluating what's the applicable a potential rate of increase that may apply to any categories of damages uh, to apply proper deductions when um, applicable um, and to conduct uh, projections of um, whatever the categories of damages may be in a particular case. Okay. Uh, in this case, you don't dispute that Ken Kendall Thomas will never work again, do you? I don't have an opinion on that. Is that an assumption that you made for your calculations? I provided the analysis of potential damages. Um, I do not make a determination of ability or inability to work. Okay. Do you agree that the jury is in charge of deciding how long Kendall Thomas would have worked had she not been injured? Um, I think that's more of a legal question. Uh, as an economist, I can provide what's the methodology to arrive at that determination. I cannot provide a professional opinion on what the jury would do. Okay, and so and that's that's fair. But it, it, I think it's a, a yes or no question. Do you agree that the jury, as opposed to an economist or any expert? is in charge of deciding how long Kendall Thomas would have worked had she not been injured. I'm going to object to the form, but you can answer. I think the jury ultimately is the decision maker. However, the role of the economist is to provide the reasonable analysis and the parameters and the data and information and the methodology in order for the jury to be assisted in making that determination. Okay. So, th so that's a yes. I would say yes. I mean, most of these questions are not a yes or no in my opinion, but I would say yes. Okay. Ultimately, they decide based on what the information that is presented. Okay. And you can't say with 100% certainty whether Kendall would have obtained a bachelor's degree or a professional degree, can you? 
No, there is no 100% certainty. You agree that the jury is in, is in charge of deciding the level of education that Kendall Thomas would have likely achieved had she not been hit by a car? Again, it's not a yes or no question, in my opinion. The jury will evaluate the data that is presented, the calculations that are presented, the methodology that is presented, and they will make a determination. So that's a yes, the jury is in charge of deciding based on evaluating the data, how or uh, what degree of education Kendall would have achieved had she not been injured? Uh, yes, they will make that determination based on the information presented. Okay. And, and you can't say with 100% certainty how long Kendall Thomas will live, can you? I don't think anybody can. I am not a medical expert, uh, and it is not the scope of my analysis to establish with certainty. Uh, uh, that's a matter for other experts. Is that a, a no? You no, know you cannot say with 100% certainty how long Kendall will live? I can rely on uh, statistical information produced by life tables or by other experts in their opinions. Um, a determination of life expectancy is not something that can be established with 100% certainty. Okay, so j that's a no. No, you cannot say with 100% certainty how long Kendall Thomas will live, correct? Kendall Thomas or anybody. So that, that's a yeah, that's correct? Yes, yeah, it's, it's correct. Okay. You agree that the jury is in, is in charge of evaluating the data and deciding how long Kendall will live uh, such that any verdict will cover uh, Kendall's entire life? I'm going to object to the form, but you can answer. Yeah, I just don't like the use of the word um, determined. They may have an estimate but nobody can say for sure. I don't think so. Sure. Well, I, did, I don't think I used the word determined. But or decide, um, there was a word in there. If you could just uh, reread the question. Sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll change, uh, well, I mean, it is decide. So you agree that the jury is in, dis in charge of evaluating the data and deciding how long Kendall Thomas will live, correct? Uh, they would estimate how long she will live. Okay. But it, it, it's the role, I guess the, the main point is that you agree that it is the role of the jury to cover that, that point, that point being the length of time that Kendall will live. Ultimately, the jury will have a verdict, then part of that will be, this is their estimate of life expectancy. Okay. Um, in reaching your opinions, are you, um, are you using a discounted cash flow model? Yes. And your report uh, challenges Mr. Gingras's factual assumptions, is it correct? Uh, I am challenging his assumptions, methodology, process, data, uh, I am not comfortable with the term factual assumptions because there are some facts, there are some assumptions, um, and they're not necessarily the same. Okay, that's a, that's a good point. Let me just let me re-ask the question. You're you are challenging Mr. Gingras's assumptions in this case, correct? Right. Among other things, yes. What are the other things? I disagree with the use of some of the sources that are cited in the notes that are below the tables that are part of this Excel file um, that I'm referring to, for lack of a better term, Mr. Gingras tables and notes. Um, uh, there are documents that are cited, sources that are external, uh, assumptions that are constructed on various things, and I am commenting on the use of those, um, the selection, the applicability. Okay. So there are various things that I am addressing in my report. 
So other than the sources and assumptions the, that Mr. Gingras made, are you criticizing anything else? Well, I'm not sure where your question is going. Uh, I think um, data is critical, number one. If inapplicable data is utilized, um, everything else follows, right? So if I am opposing the use of the data, uh, I'm not necessarily commenting on the actual mathematical calculations, but I am commenting on the approach. I'm commenting on the assumptions, how those assumptions were constructed and the speculative nature of the vast majority of his work. Okay, so I think I think the answer was some was sort of in the middle in between that that response. You so you were you were disagreeing with applicability of some of the sources that Mr. Gingrich cites and some of the assumptions that he made, but you are not disagreeing with the mathematics, the, the methods that he used to calculate those numbers. Uh, that's a good question. Let me be clear about that. I am not disagreeing with the actual mathematical operations, meaning additions, subtractions, multiplications. I am disagreeing with the data that is being used. I disagree with a significant portion of the discussion that is uh, beneath the tables in that document that was produced. Um, and so math is a tool. Uh, I did not find a mathematical error uh, that I can recall, if that is your question. But if the methodology or the assumptions or the documents are being used or the data that is relied on is valid or erroneous or inapplicable or has issues or gaps or in, uh, insufficiencies, uh, then the math is necessarily wrong even if the actual calculation is correct, meaning if you're adding two plus two and it's four, but two is not the number, then the four is not the answer. Hmm. I don't know, I was trying to draw an analogy to sort of explain the point. Sure. I hope that's helpful. So I, I, before we move on, I do I wanna to try to get a clear answer to this. So your, your challenges to Mr. Gingras are to the sources that he used and the assumptions that he made. Are there any other challenges other than those two, two items? Absolutely. The discussion in the notes that accompany his tables. Um, I have um, significant comments about those. The presentation of your opinions uh, regarding Kendall's lost earnings and benefits is the exact same as Mr. Gingrich, but with different assumptions, correct? I wouldn't phrase it that way. What I did for the sake of simplicity is I made corrections to what I consider to be the most important aspects of the analysis and I applied the same methodology in terms of calculations of Mr. Gingras and made corrections to the assumptions, made corrections based on applicable data, sources, documented information, applicable external sources, so to provide a measure of damages. If you're called, uh, let me, uh, I'll just pull this up. Do you have your report by you? Um, I do have a printout here of my report. So I'm gonna, I'll refer to the, do you, you have the, the a copy of the report that was provided this morning about 15 minutes before the document started? Uh, yes. Matt, your camera fell. Yeah, or... it's, it's supposed to be that way. Oh, okay. 
All right, so this is uh, this is exhibit one from your report. If you if you're called uh, at trial, will you testify that Kendall Thomas's lost earnings and benefits would be at a minimum uh, approximately one point five million dollars? Um, well, the minimum is always zero, right? So assuming that there are damages, this is where assumptions become important because a lot of assumptions go into even what is called scenario one. Uh, one of the assumptions is that she would have achieved a high school diploma, but achieving a high school diploma does not necessarily result in earnings. And people don't work. Some people don't participate in the workforce. Some people come in and out of the workforce. So I wouldn't call that number a minimum. Um, the 1.5 million under scenario one on that exhibit one is based on the assumption that not only would she have achieved a high school diploma, but also that she would have worked for her entire work life expectancy and would have earned those wages and fringe benefits. Mm -hmm. So it is a minimum if those assumptions are considered. It cannot be considered in a vacuum. You have to provide a context. Sure. So let, let me re-ask the question with a little context then. Um, so if you're called to testify at trial, will you offer the opinion that, uh, you know, assuming that Kendall Thomas worked her entire work-life expectancy, and had gotten a high school diploma that her damages would be approximately $1.5 million. That's correct. Okay. And then, um, so then if, if you're called at trial, then you will also testify that assuming Kendall worked her entire work life expectancy and obtained a bachelor's degree, her uh, lost earnings and benefits would be approximately $2.4 million. That's correct. Under the assumption that she would have worked consistently for her entire work life expectancy. Okay. And then, and then for scenario, scenario three, if you were called to testify at trial, uh, assuming that Kendall got a professional degree and worked her entire work life expectancy, you would testify that her damages her lost earnings would be approximately $3.6 million, correct? Yes. Uh, yes, under all of those assumptions uh, in the work-life expectancy that's based on each of those levels of education, yes, I will testify to that number. Okay. And I wanna to flip to exhibit three of your amended report. Um, can you see that all right? Uh, it's very small um, on is there any way you can enlarge it? Is that better? That's a little bit better. I'm gonna have to squint here and hope that my contact lenses help me out. Okay. <laughs> It's a little bit blur. Okay, that's good. I can see the numbers. Thank you. I appreciate that. No problem. Um, so Thank you um, for allowing me to squint here. Uh, so sign of my age. A sign of my age. It's all, it's all good. No worries. Um, so I want I want to focus on these bottom three scenarios. Um, so the first scenario uh, projects. Am I correct in in saying that? The first scenario projects Kendall's the expense of Kendall's medical life care plan, assuming a life expectancy of 15 additional years. Uh, that is correct. So if we're looking at the column, this the reads present value of the total cost. Mm -hmm. That last column, the sort of like greenish highlighted area is the total cost of the future care. Yes. Okay. So if you're called to testify at trial, 
um, assuming that Kendall will only live an additional 15 years, you will testify that Kendall Thomas's medical life care plan would be three point about three point five million dollars, correct? Uh, yes, three point five eight million. Yes. Okay, and then so the second scenario would be, you know, if you're called to testify at trial, uh, and assuming that Kendall will live an additional eighteen years, you will testify that her medical life care care plan will cost approximately four point one million dollars. Uh, yes, I, I just want to say something that I meant to say before, assuming nothing changes, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Assuming nothing changes between now and trial. I just want to make sure that it is understood and that it is on the record that all of these numbers are based on the data and information that are available today. Sure. Nobody has tomorrow for sure guaranteed. So mm -hmm. data can change, facts can change. So based on what we know today, yes, 4.1 million is what I will testify to under the premise and the assumption that she will live an additional 18 years. Okay. Um, and then, so if you are called to testify at trial um, under the third scenario, assuming that nothing else changes in that Kendall will live an additional 25 years, you will testify that her medical life care plan costs approximately $5.1 million, correct? That is correct. Um, and uh, you're not qualified to give opinions specifically uh, to an individual's life expectancy, are you? Um, as an economist, I rely on I'm not a life expectancy expert, if that's your question. As an economist, I rely on life tables and or opinions by other experts, which are typically in the medical or life expectancy field um, to establish what the life expectancy may be. Sure. So it depends, it depends on the case. You're, you're not a, a statistician, are you? I'm an economist. Are you so economists have very strong requirements on knowledge of statistics and econometrics. And I've done a substantial number of that. So as an economist, I'm not a PhD in statistics. I'm a PhD in economics, but economics training requires a substantial amount of statistics. Are you an expert statistician? Yes or, yes or no? I wouldn't say so. I'm an expert economist. You, you don't have a degree in epidemiology, do you? I do not. And you, you're not a medical doctor, correct? I am not. Uh, so you you are not qualified to get, to come up with a life expectancy. Rather, you rely on other experts or tables to do that, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and so in this in this this specific case, you're basing uh, your life expectancy assumptions based on Robert Chevelle's opinions? Uh, not just that. So the first two lines, one is highlighted in green, and that is just to you know make it easy for the eyes. And um, the one that is sort of pinkish in the middle, those are based on um, the documents provided by Dr. Chavel. And the third one is aligned with the information in Dr. Cantor's report. Okay, so let, let me re-ask the question then. So you're basing your life expectancy assumptions based on Dr. Chavel and Dr. Cantor, correct? That's correct. Uh, would it have been possible for you to project Kendall's medical life care plan further than you did? Well, that is where an important decision is made by an economist. That's where we have to draw the distinction between a generic publication and something that is specific to the plaintiff. A life table, which are published by the CDC, uh, in which I use regularly, 
in my work almost daily um, are statistics that do not account are life expectancy measurements that are not necessarily specific to an individual. And so when we have a more generic case, then those are applicable when there is no element that would impact that life expectancy significantly, that is the valid source. However, when we have a situation such in this case where medical experts and life expectancy experts and life care planners have provided an opinion on the likelihood of survival, of the survival rate given certain conditions, we have to rely more on that because that is specific to this particular individual, specific to the situation, to the um, to the conditions of the plaintiff. Okay, and, and I'll, I'll just for the record purposes, I'm going to object to the responsiveness of the answer and move to strike that testimony. Um, so I, what what you did is, is I think explain the follow up question to to that question, which would be why you didn't do it. My question is simply. Would it have been possible for you to project Kendall's medical life care plan further than you did? Yes or no? Mathematically, yes. Okay. And then we have the answer as to why you didn't do that. So we, we don't even need to go there. Okay. Um, let me share the screen. Can you see plaintiff's exhibit 690? Yes. And does this appear to be your current CV? If you'd like to go through it. Um, if you could scroll to the top. Um, uh, and then if you could just scroll down a couple of pages. Um, sorry, I need to get to where it talks about my volunteer work. Um, right here or further? For, further down, I believe. Um, I want to make sure that the update, uh, yes, that is the most current. Okay. And is everything in your CV, uh, which is marked as plaintiff 690, is everything in here accurate? Yes. Okay. Are you a certified professional accountant or CPA? No, I am not. And you, you are not a medical doctor, correct? I am not. Okay. Um, of the, your, your CV lists 15 publications, uh, that you have authored or co-authored uh, of those 15 publications listed in your CV, how many address economic damages in personal injury lawsuit? Uh, could you put my CV back on the screen? Yes. Just want to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Uh, publications. Could you scroll down a little bit more? Okay, could you scroll down a little bit more? Okay, yes, every single one of them relates to economic damages. Uh, so my, my question was a little narrower than that. Of the 15 publications listed on your CV, how many address economic damages in personal injury lawsuits? Oh, um, so we have to go one by one uh, because not all of them are in personal injury. Um, some of them are on lost profits, some of them are employment disputes. The one on 50, Article 50 and 50B, which is specific to New York, I think is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven down. Um, that is specific to personal injury. Um, the next one at the crossroads of healthcare reform relates to uh, personal injury matters and analysis in these kinds of cases. The next one about employee benefits is also related to 
personal injury, um, uh, compensatory damages in lost wage claims is also for personal injury. Um, and some of them overlap between personal injury and employment. Um, the next one, even though it says damages in labor and employment disputes designed in the economic damages model and the role of the expert is also applicable to personal injury. Um, the next one is also applicable to personal injury. Um, and the, the last two, even though they're not directly related, uh, the use of attrition rates, um, and the reply to comments on the use of attrition rates, although those were done in the context of employment disputes, those are also applicable um, to not the next two, the an alternative approach to a critical issue in employment is not related to personal injury. The last two are. Okay. Or rather they have applicability, direct applicability to personal injury matters. Okay. And so before before we move on, I wanna I wanna make make the question clear. So it, I'm not asking whether the principles are applicable to personal injury. I'm asking if any like how many of these publications specifically address and discuss personal injury lawsuits and economic damages in those lawsuits. Do we need to change any of these? Uh, I don't recall, as I sit here at the moment, whether the word personal injury is in these publications per se. So um, I'm just going by the titles right now. So. Um, you, you did you wrote all of these publications i did yes i did do you have um do you keep copies of these papers yes and where, where do you keep them uh i don't have them available now but they're on our server okay so you could you could provide those to us if we if we need a request for them i believe so yes they're publicly available all of them are publicly available. Um, what does so your firm your firm is called Analytical Economic Associates? Is that right? Yes, Analytical Economics Associates. Um, so I'm just going to refer to that as AEA to make, to move things along a little quicker. Um, what does A what does AEA do for business? Can you repeat the question? What does your company do do for business? Uh, well, I am the founder and the owner, sole owner of analytical of AEA. That's what we call it internally too. Um, the focus of my business is to provide analyses of economic damages, sometimes statistical analyses, but the vast majority of the work is to provide economic damages analysis in legal disputes on in in matters involving personal injury, wrongful death, employment disputes, um, some lost profits, um, or some hybrid cases, but this is 100% of our operations are economic damages pretty much. Okay. Um, and in, in, in I want to break down a couple follow-up questions. So you said you're the sole owner. So you own 100% of the the shares of AEA. That's correct. Okay. What what is, what kind of uh, corporate entity is AEA? LLC, Limited Liability Company. And are, and so you are. Are there any other members or? No. Members? No. You have sole discretion to make business decisions and you receive all of the profits. That was a actually Perfect profits. Uh, yes, I yeah, I don't receive all the profits. I pay taxes on those. Yeah, your rest takes a good chunk. Let me, I'll withdraw that question. Uh, so you, you you have the sole discretion to make business decisions. That is correct. 
And then after after paying all of your taxes, you receive all of the profits of the LLC. Is that is that fair? Yes, I pay the taxes on the personal tax return because mm -hmm. it's an LLC, it's a pass-through entity. Um so it is is it your testimony that 100% of AEA's revenue is generated from expert consulting work on litigation cases of uh, different kinds? Uh, yes, 100% of the revenues are generated from cases involving economic damages, some statistical, and we work as a team. A team. Okay. So would it be fair to sort of, if, we're, if we were to break down the categories of work that your firm does, would it be fair to break them into the th three categories of personal injury is one, two, employment disputes, and three, business disputes? Yes, we can we can put it that way. Is, is there a different way that you internally categorize the, the work that you do? Well, we, we break it down as personal injury, wrongful death, employment disputes. There is a category that I refer to as hybrid for lack of a better term, which are personal injury or wrongful death matters that involve business owners. And in those cases, it's really more of a, an analysis of the business and the profits that would have been generated. So those are more of a commercial damages analysis, lost profits type of spin to establish the personal damages. So would an example of a hybrid case be like an executive who was killed in a car wreck and you had to calculate, you know, what his distributions from the company would have been and which would re require an analysis of, you know, the company. That's, that's a very good generic example. Yes. Um. So what, what percentage, so using those three categories and, um, I guess first, it's. It, it th I think this would get too complicated if we include that hybrid category. Yeah. What, what percentage of AEA's work is on personal injury and, and or wrongful death cases? I would say about seventy percent this year. This Probably year. more than that, seventy to eighty percent this year. Okay. And, and this year, this year being the, the twenty twenty three. What about last year? Um, I have to think in either in terms of count of cases versus size of revenues of each case. So I would say about the same number with the balance being on uh, employment disputes and other types of damages. Okay. So, uh, so 70% personal injury, wrongful death, 30. 70 to 80 percent. Yeah. 80 percent. And I just want to clarify that that number may not be accurate because I have to look at do metrics and statistics to give a more precise sure. number. But, you know, I think for sake of this conversation will be OK. OK, so 70 to 80 percent personal injury and then 30, you know, 20 to 30 percent employment or business dispute? Yes. Okay. Why, why did you start your company? Oh, wow. I love to tell that story. I love to tell that story. So um, I always had a dream of being a business owner, always since I was a kid. Uh, and I decided I was going to be an economist when I was 16. So I don't know how far back you want to go, but um, uh, I have been in this profession since I completed my PhD 25 years ago. And I worked for a couple of consulting firms. I taught uh, at university, um, at the university level, both in Venezuela and in the United States. And um, my last, let me call it, employment arrangement was with a public accounting firm in New York, where I was um, a, where I was for about nine and a half years almost, and the last three and some months 
years uh, of that post, I was a principal and non-equity partner. And during the time when I was a partner, I decided that for philosophical reasons um, and life dream reasons, I was going to start my own practice. So I decided that I was going to leave the firm and take the leap of faith and start my own business, which I did in May of 2016. You just got the very abridged version. I love to tell that story. So <laughs> if you poke the bear, we're going to be talking for three days. <laughs> and I, I just really, really, really love to tell that story. Yeah, I can tell. My kids are, my kids are sick and tired of hearing it. So just for the well, record. <laughs> seven hours and we've got another deposition in the case i know i know um so you got the very average version uh, well thank you um how many employees does aea have three and uh and who are those employees excuse me uh, who, who are those employees oh who are those employees um so um one of my employees, her name is Jaren Zelinsky. Uh, she actually worked with me in the city for almost nine and a half years. And then when I left the city, she stayed at home and raised her children. And less than a year ago, she joined our team. She's our most recent team member as AA, but she and I have worked together for more than 10 years altogether. Um, the next one, her name is Parulben Amin, and she has been working with me uh, for four and a half, almost five years. Um, and then Monica Duarte uh, joined our team a little bit more than two years ago. Okay. Um, so of those three employees, how many are economists? Uh, Jaren Zelinsky, her background is in economics, and she is also a certified fraud examiner. Um, Parulben Amin, um, she, her background is in business management, analytics, and finance. And Monica Duarte is actually a former teacher, was an English teacher in a bilingual school and decided to make a career change a few years ago. Um, and she has an important role, just everybody, just like everybody else on this team. Okay. Um, so of, of the three employees in, in yourself, how many testify as economists? Just me. Um, does anyone at your company have uh, a CPA? No. We all have a background in financials and accounting to various degrees because of our knowledge um, and our training, but we're not CPAs per se. Uh, did any of the employees of your firm do any work on this case? Everybody worked on this case. What, uh, what work, I guess let's start with Jaren. Um, what, what work did Jaren do in this case? There'll be some details I will not remember, so I will speak generally. So one of the things that Jaren does is to assist with replications of the analysis by opposing experts. So when we see an analysis, whether it's tables, whether it's in a report, we always stay to the task of reconstructing that math and evaluate whether there are any errors and to make sure that the process and methodology by the opposing expert is fully understood. And so that's one of her main responsibilities. That's She's not the only one who does that, but that is one of her main responsibilities. She also provides assistance with uh, preparing cross-examination questions sometimes um, she assists me with uh, the draft reports um, and she provides quality control. Uh, 
Um, then uh, Barun Ben, um, she works on processing all of the documents that we receive, conducts research as applicable to a case, uh, and it's all under my guidance and in con direct consultation with me. Um, she provides, she starts preparing all of the calculations and the, what we call preliminary analysis. Um, and then she also does quality control and works with me on the reports. Uh, Monica Duarte, her focus is a significant amount of her time is on administrative tasks. So she assists me with uh, business management issues and tasks, but she's also responsible for uh, document management and flow. Uh, she summarizes depositions. Uh, she also assists with proofreading reports, uh, preparing lists of documents and that sort of thing. And then I am in everything and anything of all of those things. Um, I do calculations, I write reports, I do research, I look at the reports by the opposing experts and all of the above. Okay. Um, how, does your, how does your company advertise? We don't. We have a website. How do you market for business? We don't. Other than having a website, we don't have any marketing materials. How do you, uh, how do you get business? It's really referrals. Um, it's cross referrals. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for that. Um, do you know how the defense found you in this case? I believe it was a referral, but I am not sure actually. Do you know, you know who referred them to you? I don't recall. Is that I may have asked the question, but I don't. Sorry, Marisa, I don't remember. Is that something that you would uh, like document in some some file? like how, how the case came in? It, it really varies. I don't know that there's anything specific in this case. I may have received the phone call. I don't I don't remember, we have to look back. Um, okay. So do you, do you keep like a company, do you, uh, like not you personally, but like as a company, is there a policy to dot, like mark the file when a case is referred in, you know, to indicate where the, the referral came from? No, we actually don't do that. Okay. You know, do you know why um, they hired an economist based out of New Jersey instead of Georgia? I am not privy to that decision. Okay. Um, so focusing on the only the personal injury and wrongful death cases that your firm handles. What's the breakdown between retention on cases where you are hired on behalf of an injured individual versus a defendant or law firm or company? Uh, I would say about 85% is uh, defense and about 15% will be about plaintiff. And that varies from year to year. I'm just trying to give you a generic number. Sure. Uh, so it could be it could be more than eighty five percent. It could be less. It really varies. Okay. Um, and then, I guess uh, I was going to ask, you know, what's the breakdown between plaintiffs and defendants for you personally? But it sounds like it's really a collaborative effort. Your entire team works together on cases. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that is a very big philosophical issue for us to work together as a team. I agree. We brainstorm, we have opinions, we make sure that we have a very strong collaborative spirit. Um, so before starting your company, the New York consulting firm that you worked for, was that Marks Panna? That's correct. 
Okay. And then Mark's Panif was uh, acquired by a larger corporate entity in 2022. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, I um, actually, I was surprised by that, uh, but um, through LinkedIn mm -hmm. is how I found out. Uh, had you already left Mark's Panif at the time of the acquisition? Oh, yes. I left in April of 2016. And I think the acquisition might have been last year. Okay. Um, if I recall correctly what I saw, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, and, uh, and so Mark's Panif was, it was a, a public accounting firm, I think you said earlier? Yes. Um, what would, and what was your role? Uh, Pardon me, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. What was your role with Mark Spanish? What was my role at Mark Spanish? Um, well, um, my initial role at Mark Spanish, I was hired as an economist to be the replacement for a partner who was um, moving towards retirement. And the original idea was that I would work with him and um, be his replacement economist upon retirement. Um, as uh, during the first couple of years that I was there, um, I quickly turned to developing my own business, uh, developed my own book of business, that partner retired. And so I continue basically what I had been developing as my own practice mm -hmm. within the um, the advisory group, which changed the litigation group that changed names a couple of times while I was there. Um, and so my role at Marsh Paneth was really a team leader, with the exception of the first, I would say, year and a half or so. Uh, I started bringing in my own clients, my own cases, my own projects. Um, and so the vast majority of my time, I did what I do today, uh, work on cases, be retained, talk to clients, uh, do research, um, learn and improve my knowledge every day as much as I can. Same thing. Okay. So at, Mark, at Mark's Panet, um, what, like, what percentage of your work was testifying and, you know, preparing reports and cases? Uh, as far as testifying, um, I would say that the vast majority of cases settle. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, my CV, which you put on the screen a few minutes ago, uh, has a list of all of my testimony. Uh, it is not a reflection of the amount of work that we do. Okay. I may testify once or twice in a year um, sometimes mediations, arbitrations, things like that, depositions. Um, I would say that more than 99% of the cases settle. Um, and also the cases kind of like linger from one year to the next. Um, so the amount of time that I spend related to trial or deposition testimony uh, is sort of like um, per se, like for instance, today is the smallest time mm. in my practice. A lot of times I prepare for trial and then I'm called two hours before I'm supposed to be there to tell, to let me know that the, the case settled. Um, however, I consider philosophically that all the time that I spend on a case, is preparation for trial. Okay, that's fair. All litigation. So we have to be in that frame of mind. Well, let me, I want, let me ask that question uh, differently, I think. So um, what what percentage of your work at Mark's Panda was litigation consulting as opposed to some sort of, some other type of economic work like research or analysis for you know, non-litigation matters. Oh, okay. Um, I actually worked on some very interesting uh, projects. I did some transfer pricing work while I was at Mark Spanish. Um, I don't do that anymore because just the time constraints are tremendous. 
Um, I also uh, prepared an analysis of social impact um, <clears throat> that was actually quite interesting, uh, related to uh, former inmates on probation and the social impact related to um, engaging parolees in the workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, that took several months and was quite interesting. So, and there were other projects uh, related to research. One of them involved uh, my original country of Venezuela. Uh, that was uh, quite interesting. So, but I would say that over all of the years that I was at Mark Spanish, 90% of my work was related to litigation matters. Okay. Uh, and I consider also all of the research and studying and attending conferences for purposes of my knowledge um, and, and the field of economics also part of the litigation. So uh, definitely 90% of my work that is non-administrative is in this. Okay. So while you were at Mark's Panic, what was the breakdown of cases in which you were retained by uh, a defendant or someone defending allegations of personal injury as opposed to an injured party? I would say it would be about the same percentage. Um, I get contacted by attorneys on plaintiff's side regularly, but not as much as on the defense. So, uh, I would say 80 to 85%. So Mark, Mark's Panath uh, would take cases where someone, they would, they were, uh, sorry, terrible question. Let me restart. So Mark, no. Mark's Panath was retained by plaintiffs in personal injury lawsuits? Uh I don't know if Mark Spanith was retained. I can only speak as to whether I was retained. Okay. And during so you were you were at Mark Spanith for it looks like five or eight years. Uh, well, from two thousand seven to two thousand sixteen. So about nine and change. At first, I was a consultant, an affiliate, and then I was a full time employee something like that. Um, so altogether, nine and a half years, from 2007 to 2016, yes. So of the, of the nine and a half years that you were at Mark's Pana, um, how many cases did you, or how many cases were you retained by a lawyer representing an injured party or someone who had died? Oof, there's so many, so many on either side. I mean, uh, Certainly more than uh, that I was retained or that I worked on. That you were retained on behalf of the inquiry. On behalf of, oh, I don't remember that number. I, it's just too far back in time. I, I don't even have the records to look it up. Okay. Well, you, do you not remember because it, there were, the number is so large or just because it was so long ago? It was so long ago and I really don't remember how many. Um, I, I really don't remember. Can you can you tell me about a single case that you remember uh, in which you were retained by an injured party while you worked at Mark's Pana? Hmm. Actually, I think it's it's in my CV. I was looking at my CV. Do you still have my CV handy? Sure. See if that can jolt my memory. I think there is one in there. That I actually testified to. Um, if you can put it on the screen. Well, let's I'll put it on the screen in just a second. I want sure. I'll, before we do that. I, I want to ask if, if you have a I want to your memory. I want to see, do you have any specific memory of working on a case at, while at Mark's Panic in which you were retained by an injured party? Yes. 
Okay. And what, what do you remember about that case? And the reason why I remember some aspects of that case is because it's in my CV, because otherwise it's just too much time that has elapsed. Uh, I believe it involved a, a, a rabbi. I was retained. I, I remember speaking to the attorney and preparing for trial on the case. And I remember it was a medical malpractice case. Um, But I don't want to push my memory any further than that, because that I may misrepresent something and I don't want to do that. Sure. Uh, understood. So I don't uh, want to mislead anybody. So uh, during your nine and a half years at Mark's Panic, uh, the only only specific case that you can remember as we sit here today uh, in which you were retained by an injured party was that medical malpractice case that we just talked about. Well, the, the reason why I remember is because it's in my CV and I review my CV regularly to make sure it's accurate and complete. And so I see it. I don't remember the name of the top of my head, but I know it's there. And I remember because I testified in that case. Um, beyond that, um, I may unintentionally say something that is not correct. And, Okay, and we'll go through. We're going to go through with those cases here in a minute. Sure. Uh, would you agree that one of your roles at Mark's Panic was to critique expert reports submitted by plaintiffs' experts? Uh, critique expert reports both by plaintiff and defense. But yes, yes, the answer to that is yes. Okay. Um, so, can you tell me about what I saw that there were several roles that you had that looked like they were with the Venezuelan government? Can you explain those roles? Yes, that's another fascinating story. So um, I worked for two of the government institutions in Venezuela right after I finished college. Uh, two of my professors in college uh, offered me jobs as soon as graduating uh, to work with them um, in these government organizations. Um, one of them is called Cordiplan, which is the planning office, the central planning office of Venezuela. And um, in my role, I worked uh, in the division that was called the short-term planning division. And part of my role was to work with uh, government-owned um, companies in the steel industry and in the aluminum industry. Uh, and to work with the operating budget as these companies were in the process of being considered for privatization. Uh, and then I did that for about a year and change. And then um, was my boss at the time who had been one of my professors in college. He was appointed to be the head of the budget office for Venezuela which is called OSEPRE. It's no longer called that. I have no idea. I left Venezuela 31 years ago, so I don't know what those changes have been. Uh, we're still in touch now and then. Um, and so I worked uh, directly with um, the chief of the budget office as what it was called um, the also pre assistant, which was a uh, liaison with a committee that had been um, appointed by the president of Venezuela to evaluate public expenditure. And I was the economist at the table with these other uh, ministers of the government of Venezuela to work towards producing documentation and, and um, recommendations for changes in public spending. It was very interesting, especially as a new graduate from college. It was very, very interesting. Very different from what I do today. Very different from what I do today. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I did. It was very interesting. I'm sure it was. That, that was an, I'm, a, I'm a history nerd, and that was an interesting time in Venezuela. 
And it was a very um, difficult time in Venezuela of a lot of political turmoil. So that's another story that's very long that I love to tell. So outside of this deposition, if you want to hear it, I am happy to fly down <laughs> to Atlanta and have a cup of coffee and tell you all about it. I think it's fascinating. Um, even as an outsider, it's just, you know, I remember the old crisis of the 1970s. I was a teenager back then. So I have a lot of stories to tell. Um, all right, so moving on. Um, so you're, you're charging $495 per hour for your work on this case. Uh, is that correct? I believe that's correct. Uh, how many hours as uh, you know before today have you spent on the on the case? I would I don't recall the total number of hours, but we have put a lot of work into this case. We um, I like to consider ourselves sort of like curators, like we really focus a lot and we do have a lot of internal discussions to make sure they were all aligned. So a lot of time has gone into this case. Uh, how much are you charging today for your deposition testimony? Uh, whatever is in my fee schedule, uh, I think it's $500 per hour for each hour of testimony. Okay, so so you you just you charge your hourly rate for all work on the case, whether it's whether it's me taking your deposition or you consulting with Marisa and her team. It, you... I, for testimony, there's a little bit more of a charge, but if that's an issue, I can keep the same rate. That's not a problem. Um, but yes, it's very similar. Um, so I'm going to share the screen again because I think it'd be easier to kind of roll, run through this. Can you see that clearly? I can. Um, I guess actually, let me ask a few general questions first. Um, your, your testimony list goes back to 2010. Um, did you pr ever provide expert testimony uh, on economic damages in a personal injury lawsuit before 2010? No, all of my testimony is in my CV. Okay. Um, and it looks like uh, all of your testimony since 2010, or I guess all of your testimony ever, has been in New York or New Jersey? Yes. Is this your first case uh, in Georgia? In Georgia, yes. Okay. Um, through, um, so Williams, um, who, who retained you in Williams? Uh, does the county of Nassau. Um, and what kind of case was Williams? Um, it was an injury matter involving a court officer. Okay. Um, did the, did the plaintiffs have an economist in that case? Yes. And did you criticize the plaintiff's economist opinions? Yes. Or I guess let me ask that in a clearer way. What were your criticisms of the plaintiff's economists and Williams? Uh, I'm sorry, but I can't recall the details. Um, but that is public record. Because I testified, so... I don't recall the details of the case. Okay. Did you, and I assume you, did you, this was a trial. Um, did you offer opinions on what the damages were, if there were damages in this trial? I believe so, yes. And um, 
what were what were your what were the economic damages in your opinion in that case? Oh, I don't remember the numbers. You remember? And, and I don't and I don't know that I am at liberty to discuss that. Uh, we have a confidentiality agreement, sure. um, and sure. I'm not at liberty to discuss the details of these cases for a number of years after they're resolved. I don't even know if the case is resolved or not. Well, you testified at trial. I testified at trial. So my testimony, uh, I don't have a copy of it, but my testimony is, I would assume, is public record. Mm -hmm. Did, uh, did the jury reach a verdict in the Williams case? I believe so. I don't know the details. Do you know whether the verdict was for the plaintiff or the county? How would you define that? Whether they found damages or not? Um, I believe they found damages. I don't know the details. So you, you don't know the amount of the verdict? No, I do not. Okay. Um, is, is 20, $20 million sound right? 20, 20.5 million? I can't say because I have not seen any documents with the jury verdict. Mm. Okay. I have not been provided with that information. I don't know if there are any post-trial proceedings. I don't know. Typically after I testify, it's like it just goes in a vacuum. Sometimes I'm informed and some, most of the time I'm not. Okay. So, what kind of case was uh, Malachek? Is that, is that right? That was an employment dispute. Um, and were you retained by the plaintiff or the defendant company? I was retained by defense counsel. Okay. Um. What about Ryan Kent versus New Basive Inc? What kind of case was that? Um, it was a product liability and medical malpractice, personal injury. Yes. And uh, which of these parties retained you? I know it was counsel for defense, but there are several defendants, so I don't remember who they were representing in specific. And in, in this, in um, in the Kent case, did you prepare a economic report? I believe I did, yes. Okay. Yeah, and I had gave my deposition, so that would have been, that implies that I wrote a report. Okay. For the most part, I would say, yes. Do you keep your, your um, the transcripts of your depositions? Do you have a database that has those? I actually do not. Um, okay. Do you recall um, any of the lawyers uh, who were in the Kent case? I know who's the attorney who we we keep a database of the name of the attorney who retained me officially. Okay, and what was that attorney's name? I don't think that I am at liberty to discuss that. I will have to get authorization to release any further information. Okay, who, who do you need authorization from? The attorney. The attorney who retained me. Okay, do you have a, is there a confidentiality agreement? Yes, our retainer agreement includes a confidentiality stipulation. That all, um, all facts of the case remain confidential. Okay. Um, without time limits. So unless, if something is asked, I, in order to preserve the confidentiality of every case is the safest thing to do in the interest of the cases themselves, plaintiffs included, there's a lot of personal information in these cases. So I will have to get 
authorization to provide any further information from the specific attorneys that handle the matter. Okay, so you you are taking the position that you are unable to tell me the name of the attorney who hired you in the Kent case? Uh, yes, I, I would not be able to do that today. Okay, that's fine. Um, Hernandez, what kind of case was that? I believe that was also a PI case. Okay. Who, who retained you in, in Hernandez? And I believe that was also defense. Okay. Um, and so I've, I've never arbitrated a case. Does arbitration mean that you testified at, at the the actual, you know, in front of a panel of arbitrators? There was one arbitrator. Uh, there was no transcript, no court reporter that I remember, which I found interesting. But yes, they took my oath and I testified as as I am doing here today. Okay. And you, and you had a report in that case similar to the report you have case i would say yes um because i don't see how i would testify without having produced some kind of report but the rules are different in some jurisdictions that okay. allow just for you know there's other things that we can discuss about that i would i would think so yes i would have to check uh to confirm but i would say yes okay um what about Reyes. What was that? What was the nature of that case? Um, that case involved, if I recall correctly, only a life care plan. But it was a personal injury or two plaintiffs. Um, and who retained you in Reyes? Defense counsel. Um, what kind of case was Boland? I'm trying to think. I can't recall if it was a personal injury or an employment dispute. So I do not recall. So that's a question mark. Um, who retained you in that case? I believe it was defense. Okay. What was uh, the Baum trial about? That uh, it was a personal injury. That's the best of my recollection, because now it's starting to get to be seven years ago. So um, I believe so. Yes. Um, oh, sorry, I, d I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, that that's all I was going to say. Um, and who, who retained you? I believe it would have been the defense. Defense counsel. All right. What was um, the Christo case about? That one was a commercial damages case. Um, okay. Um, who retained you in Christo? I would say it was counsel for the county of Nassau, counsel representing the county of Nassau. Was, were they a party? Well, wait a minute, let me see. Uh, 
no, I testified in the county of Nassau. Uh, I believe it would have been counsel for the incorporated village of Lawrence. Okay. What was uh, Stolowski? I was a multiple plaintiff case. Um, there were several personal injury and several wrongful death plaintiffs in that action. Okay. And, um, and who retained you in Stolowski? Actually, remember that I was retained by counsel representing the private entity, 234 East 178th Street. Was that a premises liability case? Um, it involved the fire, um, so I don't know if that is premises liability or what that will be referred to, um, but it involved six firefighters who are plaintiffs in this action. Okay. What, um, this looks like it's an interesting one. What was uh, Retchko? That is the, um, that was a wrongful death medical malpractice case. Okay. And who retained you in that case? It was plaintiff's counsel. Who is, who is the plaintiff's lawyer that hired you in that case? Oof, I don't remember his name. I will have to look back. And it looks like you testified at the trial. And I testified in 2015, which means I don't have any of those records. Hmm. Uh, Newman, what case was that? That was an employment dispute. Um, and who retained you? Uh, counsel for the school district, so defense. Was it, is this a, a discrimination case? Uh, yes, it was a discrimination case. Do you have a deposition? Do you it might have been what's called reverse discrimination case, but I'm not 100% sure of the term for this particular one. Okay. Um, I'm guessing that this, the Nassau Off-Track Betting Corporation, this was a business dispute? This was a business dispute, yes. And uh, who retained you? Uh, the national well counsel for the Nassau regional off track betting as plaintiff side and were there there were there were cross claims and and uh, counterclaims in that case yes it was a very interesting and complicated case yes what about Bar Barella? That was an, um, let me see, that was an employment dispute. And who, who retained you? Um, I know it was defense and I believe it was counsel for the village of Freeport. Okay. And you testified at trial in this case? I did. Was this, was this a, um, is this also a discrimination case? Yes. Uh, what was Heinz about? Fine. Heinz, if I recall correctly, was a personal injury matter. Who retained you in Heinz? I believe it was defense counsel. Could you uh, move the page up a little bit? Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, uh, Crabet? Crabet. Wayne Crabet. What uh, what was Crabet? Uh, he's actually the football, the former football player, which I did not know that at the time I was retained for the case because I know nothing about sports. Um, yes, that was a combination between employment claim, a business dispute with some component involving claims of police involvement in the case. What, what do you mean by claims of police? Um, it was a very complicated case. There was a business arrangement that was affected and um, I don't remember much more, but there was some claim that police had raided a restaurant or something like that, causing the business to be affected by it, lead to the termination of one of the people there. So I don't really recall much more, but yeah, it was employment, business, um, retaliation, a couple of different things like that. Who retained you? Uh, was defense counsel for the county of Nassau. What was uh, Warren about? Hmm. I honestly don't remember if that was a personal injury or an employment dispute. You remember? I don't remember. Okay. You, you remember who retained you in Warren? I want to say the county of Nassau, the defense, but I am not 100% certain. So I will put a question mark to that because I really don't remember. All right. Um, FTC versus Lane Labs USA. Business dispute, I'm, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah, there was this was the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, so this was a business dispute, false advertising, mm. if I remember correctly. Yes. And who, who retained you? Council for Lane Labs. Um, I'm not even going to try to say this one. It, <laughs> what was this case about? Uh, I believe that was a wrongful death case. It looks like it went to trial. Yes. And I'm realizing that there should be a line separating this case from the one above where it says Supreme Court because it looks like they're together. So there should be. I'm glad we're looking at this because I'll fix that. Um, yeah. And... Mm -hmm. um, I was retained by defense counsel. Okay. Um, Prince, what was that about? Ah, see, this is where memory starts getting fuzzy because then we have to correct the Wayne Krabat one because those two cases were related to each other. Matthew Prince versus County of Nassau was the one that was the employment slash business dispute involving claims of police retaliation. And I was retained by the defense. The previous one with Wayne Krebet, it was the consequential case that was purely a business dispute. So we need to take that out. Yes. There we go. All right. 
uh, various. What was that case about? Wow. Uh, hmm. It was either a personal injury or a wrongful death. But I am not certain. Okay. Who, who retained you in that case? I would say the defense. Just because I recall that the first few times I testified, it was defense counsel retaining me. And so I will think that that's correct. Um, um, and I, again, I don't have the records to be able to like sure. look back and say for sure. What was Pattinson about? I would say there was a, a personal injury. Um, but I don't know because I see two names, two plaintiffs' names, so I don't know if it was an, I don't recall if it was a multiple plaintiff and whether there was any wrongful death uh, aspect to it. Um, and I believe I was retained by the defense. All right. What about the Harrison case? What was that about? I believe that was also a personal injury case. Who retained you? I believe it was the defense. Right. And so the first case you ever testified in was Pearsall? Yes. And I know it was a personal injury case, but I do not recall whether um, it was it led to a wrongful death. I don't remember that. Okay. And this was a defense return? Defense, yes. And this, this testimony list includes all of the testimony that you've ever given? Uh, yes. Has any court ever ruled verbally or by written order uh, that you were not qualified to testify as an expert about any subject? No. Has any court ever ruled verbally or by written order that some testimony or part of your testimony uh, was not going to be admitted for any reason? Not to my knowledge. you read any depositions in this case? Excuse me? Did you read or review any depositions in this case? I don't think so. All I'm right. trying to think. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, so you, you identified several sources. Um, how did you rely on the, I'm probably going to butcher this, but how did you rely on the Scoob paper? Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you fully. And they, uh, you mean Scoog and Sika? Yes, the S-K-O-O-G. -S oh, yeah. Um, Gary Scoog and uh, Sika and Kruger. Um tables. Um, Dr. Kruger recently passed away. He's one of the authors of those tables. Um, the Skug and Sika tables, as we refer to um, in normal, in daily conversations, um, are work-life tables that provide the work-life expectancy of individuals based on their gender, age, 
education, and activity status in the workforce. So what those tables do is they're based on a methodology that's called the um, uh, now the name is escaping my um, my mind, but there is a very specific statistical methodology to uh, is the Markov process. Now it came back to my mind because there's something called Monte Carlo and something called Markov process. They use the Markov process, which is a very um, detailed and um, complex statistical method that evaluates the presence of people in the workforce. So that method allows for correcting for time when people are inactive in the workforce, and it gives you a measure of how many years altogether an individual of a certain age, by gender, and a certain level of education can be expected to participate in the workforce. So it is the prime measure of work-life expectancy in analysis of economic damages. Okay. Um, you, you identified the Eisman paper on assessing economic damages in Georgia. Um, how did you rely on that paper? There were a couple of things that I wanted to check. Uh, I know that one of the elements was the discount rate. Um, and the general regulations for the state of Georgia. Did you review the Eisman paper because you were you were not familiar with the regulations in Georgia before you reviewed that paper? Well, that's not a yes or no answer because I regularly read the Journal of Forensic Economics. And so I would have read, and there, um, there is a long history with the Journal of Forensic Economics, which is published by the National Association of Forensic Economics in generating papers that are specific to various states. It's, we call it the um, Damages in the United States Symposium. And so those papers are updated. So I might have read it at various points in time for general knowledge. I know that I specifically reviewed sections of it for this case. Okay. So did did you before reviewing the Eisman paper, did you know what uh, the general regulations in Georgia were for economic damages? I'm going to say no uh, to that question, just because it's not something that I was regularly doing. Okay. Um, did you know the discount rate to use in Georgia before reviewing the Iceman paper? I know that I had seen it before, um, and I had seen the code before, and in, in maybe in other publications. Um, but I reviewed that uh, paper for purposes of the discount rate, among other things. Okay. Um, you identified an ADA, Americans with Disabilities paper. How, how do you reply on that? Excuse me, I couldn't hear you. Uh, sorry. You identified uh, an Americans with Disabilities uh, Association paper, an ADA paper. How did you rely on that in ADA your, paper? How did you rely on the ADA paper informing your opinions? Uh, are you talking about the Americans with Disabilities Survey? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, that survey provides a breakdown of statistics on, um, and it was published in 2018 with data from 2014 is the most recent available that gives you some percentages on on the number of people 
who need assistance by age, by various age brackets. So I utilize that data for purposes of my analysis, for purposes of uh, correcting the assumptions um, in Mr. Gingras' tables and notes regarding the number of hours that would have been provided, that would have been spent on providing household services. Okay. Um, so the, I, I want to give a little preface to this next question. So understand, I understand that your field is is larger than just um, personal injury cases. I understand that you handle employment and business disputes. Um, so this next question I want to ask in the context of personal injury, wrongful death, medical malpractice damages, um, what are the authoritative works in your field? What are the authoritative works that? What are the authoritative works in your field? Of... Uh, can you define authoritative works? I mean, what do you mean by that? That's a very sure. generic question. What are the go-to resources for an economist evaluating economic damages in a personal injury or wrongful death lawsuit? Uh, well, the sources vary, okay? So generally speaking, um, I rely on the knowledge that I have acquired over the years, uh, having reviewed uh, sources like uh, the book Determining Economic Damages and other books on economic damages, the Journal of Forensic Economics. It, depending on the case, I would rely on work-life tables, life expectancy tables. Um, if you're talking about published sources, the Bureau of Labor Statistics sometimes, depending on the source, um, the Social Security Administration for some aspects of it. It depends on what aspect of the case is being analyzed. Um, and the way the each of those sources is utilized depends on each particular specific analysis. Um, I think I'm done. Um, if you will give me five minutes to, or let's say 10 minutes to look over my notes here. Um, I'm not going to have any questions, so we can we can do that. Okay, let's um, let's come back at ten fifty five. Okay, very right. good. So I, I have no no uh, questions. No questions. Thank you so much for your time, Doctor. Oh, there we go. You're most welcome, Counselor.